I still remember because it was almost Christmas and I got an offer from an agent that I'd like, I basically bought her at a, <laughs> at one of those charity auctions, like not bought her, but bought a reading of my manuscript and she was going to critique it. And she took so long. It was like seven, eight months past and I heard nothing. And then I found out about self-publishing, found J.A. Conrath and the, I got my first Kindle. And so I was just about to upload to Smashwords. <laughs> And she emailed back and was like, oh, hey, we might need to work on this manuscript a little bit, but I'd, you know, be interested in representing you. And I was like, I had my cover art, I had my thing edited, I was ready to go. And that night I just uploaded and said, let's do this. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 311 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In today's episode, I have an interview with Lindsay Baroker. Lindsay is a full-time independent fantasy and science fiction author who loves travel, hiking, tennis, and visitors. She's written over 100 novels, appeared on the USA Today bestseller list, and has been twice nominated for a Goodreads Reader's Choice Award. Now, Lindsay is an icon and a pioneer in our industry, she self-published her first book back in 2010 and has had a very long and extensive career as an indie author. We talk about all of that and more, and that's coming up later in this episode. First, let's hear a word about this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. Findaway Voices is a marketplace to get your audiobooks out into a global market. You can get your audiobook to more than 43 retail and library platforms. If you're looking for a narrator, you have a marketplace with Findaway Voices. You can find a narrator to work with. There's various options to make it affordable for you. If you already have your own audiobook, you can just load to Findaway Voices and you can choose which platform you want to go to or you can go to them all. There's some great opportunities, some coupon codes that you can give to get your readers started on Spotify. And there's even price promotions you can run through Findaway Voices. So many choices, so many options, the control is in your hands. And if you want to see how you can leverage Findaway Voices as an author, you can check them out over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. Because this is another week where I'm doing some traveling, I'm heading to Sudbury Comic Con this weekend. It's actually called Graphic Con, but it is basically a Comic Con. Uh, in Sudbury, Ontario, you know, the big city close to the hometown where I grew up. So I'm going to be there selling some of my books in person. And that requires a much shorter week for me to get some things done and out the door. So I'm going to kind of forego personal update, except for that little bit you just heard, as well as comments from recent episodes. But I will be getting to that back again in the next episode. So without further ado or introductory blather, why don't we get in to this interview with Lindsay Broker. Lindsay, welcome back to the Stark Reflections podcast. Thanks for having me, Mark. It has, it's been a while, so it's fun to catch up. Yeah, I mean, it's been a long time since we've chatted or even seen one another in, in person pre-pandemic years. And I remember I, I wrote it down earlier as a you were on an episode in December 2018, because I was going to say, did was I ever fortunate enough to have you on my podcast? I know I'd had you on the Kobo podcast, but I, I, and I was like, yes, I did. But it was December 2018. And oh, I can't keep track. I can't count the years. It's been a few years then, hasn't it? Yeah, and I can't remember either because we had you on our when we were doing the Six Figure Authors show, and I think maybe the sci fi marketing one too. So yes. <laughs> who knows what we talked about? I just remember your skulls. 
The skull. There's there. always skulls. Always skulls. And and yeah. And I think I'm maybe one of the last times I saw you was in Vegas with either uh, Dean Wesley Smith and Christine Catherine Rush, or at Twenty Books Vegas. Like one. Of, no, we had the meat sweats. We went. We went yes. out uh, with. Uh, and Dan I and got Laura. sick. And I think I had COVID in like November no. of 2019 before we yeah. even knew. Really? It was the weirdest cold. I had like the whole weird throat thing for like a month and a cough. And, oh, that's nasty. And, I, that's what happens when you travel and breathe all pe- all over people at conferences. I mean, not to yeah. dissuade people from going, but you know, you just that happens. Well, yeah, you but... shake a lot of hands, you hug a lot of people, that kind of stuff. But but that was the pre pandemic, and that was yeah. We went to this really awesome Brazilian steak place that I don't know who found. Yeah. Did you find it or Dan or Laura? Who was it? I don't remember. They, they have them in every major city here in the U.S. There's a chain and some other ones. I don't know if they're big in Canada, but a lot of the U.S. still likes their meat. You've got the the vegans and then the, you know, the carnivores. We just do the extremes in the U.S. It's either all or nothing one way or the other. But I think that was the last time I was at such an extravagantly delightful place where you just you don't want to eat anymore but you can't help yourself because you haven't tried that thing and they keep <laughs> so, bringing it to your table yeah yeah exactly but speaking of people bringing uh bringing things to the table um you've constantly brought great content for writers with the various podcasts and even more importantly which is which is why people want to pay attention to the cool things you get to say is the uh, you've been bringing material to writers uh, readers, I should say, for, well, we were just talking about that before we started recording. December 2010 was the very first book you published? It was. I still remember because it was almost Christmas and I got an offer from an agent that I'd like, I basically bought her at, a, <laughs> at one of those charity auctions, like not oh. bought her, but bought a reading of my manuscript and she was going to really? critique it. And she took so long. It was like seven, eight months past. I heard nothing. And then I found out about self-publishing, found J.A. Conrath, and the, I got my first Kindle. And so I was just about to upload to Smashwords. <laughs> and she emailed back and was like, oh, hey, we might need to work on this manuscript a little bit, but I'd you know, be interested in representing you. And I was like, I had my cover art. I had my thing edited. I was ready to go. And that night I just uploaded and said, let's do this. And that first book was uh, The Emperor. Uh, what, what was it? The Emperor's Edge, and I also had a collection of short stories for children, The Goblin Brothers Adventures. Oh my which, god, yes! <laughs> which, like, nobody reads. I even tried to give it away for free on my, I don't remember, it's my Patreon or maybe my newsletter, <laughs> and, like, the downloads are still almost <laughs> non-existent, but I liked them. They were cute. Wow, and so that was, so you had an agent, I don't even think I remember this, that you had an agent lined up that was willing to look at The Emperor's Edge. But you already had done the work and the research, which you were sharing in your very first podcast on what you were doing and considering. And what what made you decide to just push the button yourself rather than wait another nine months? <laughs> well, it was uh, I was ready. I had got, I'd paid for the edit by the time she got back to me and was interested. And I know that's completely normal in the publishing world. Yeah. So and I'd also kind of really gone over to like, oh, I can just do this myself because uh, the Kindle is super popular now. This is sort of I'm not sure if it's before the Kobo and the other ones, but it was quite early. Um, but the Kindle had taken off and, the you know, I was like, let's do it this way. And I'm so relieved because I don't have the patience at all. I've since learned <laughs> for the traditional world. Like I finished a novel and I want to get that sucker out the next, <laughs> if not the next day, you know, the, the next couple of weeks. And of I can't even imagine waiting like two years from the time you finished it to see it in print. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's obviously worked out, but this is not something you just tried. This is something, and, and, and I want to go back to this because even in the early days, you knew enough that you weren't going to release this work until you had it edited. So you paid for an editor yourself. You did that. You got everything good to go. I even know, I remember in the early days, you had a audio book audio version uh, made. And I'm not sure how that worked out and how you find found the narrator. I remember, still remember you, you did have um, uh, a narrator for, I don't know if you ended up using the same narrator for later books or you had to transition or how, how did that, I did. I I found patio books. Um, I think I, it was Nathan Lowell and a couple other people were doing really well back then with the releasing their audiobooks for free. And I thought, well, maybe that would be a way to get people to check out the ebooks. 
And I did the first three of my Emperor's Edge series. I even crowdfunded. I did a Kickstarter back in maybe what? 2010. You did a no, Kickstarter 20, in 2010? 2012, it probably was. Wow. wow. Uh, and to pay for the audiobook production. Because I was... There was a production company I worked with, and then the narrator got busy, so I couldn't do any more without switching narrators, which I eventually had somebody new redo the whole series. Yeah. And then the company disappeared. <laughs> and I think they still get the royalty checks for those ones. I've since replaced the first three with a box set with the new narrator. But okay. these wow. things happen. <laughs> But it's kind of amazing to, to think about. Did you ever, and, and I do I do remember discovering your first podcast and just being a, a quite a fanboy of the process of watching you discover the possibility, right? Back in the day, the only two options you had were Smashwords and KDP, right? Those are the only two options for, for getting stuff. And then later on, I know I was, I was listening to it when Kobo hired me and I hadn't launched Kobo Writing Life yet. So there was no easy way to get into Kobo. You had to go through Smashwords or some other platform. And then and then you've seen probably more change. I think you and Joanna Penn, like when you go back to the the pioneers of this industry, you've seen so much change. And I can't do the math, but it's what, 13, 13 years now? Yeah, this is a little over 12 years. And it's it was funny to me because a lot of people, I, I've said this on my other show too, that they're upset because it's pay to play. It's so hard to get visibility in the stores unless you have a lot of money to spend on advertising. And I'm like, right. it was hard to get visibility when I got started too, because yeah. there was no way to advertise. I remember Goodreads had a weird little pay per click thing that really didn't pan out very well. And I think there was one sponsorship site at the very beginning and they kind of helped. Um, but I didn't even know how to make a book free then. Like the, it was right. this whole secret that, you know, if you price dropped on the Smashwords and, you know, <laughs> Barnes and Noble, eventually Amazon would price drop uh, to free in their store. So I was on my third book before I learned about that. And wow. that made a big difference back then because there was a free top 100 free in the Kindle store back then yeah. next to the top 100 paid for a while. So it was if you were free and you were in that top 100 which wasn't that hard to get into because not that many people knew how to make things free. Right. That was a way to get some visibility, but it was very hard. I did not sell many books with my the first year, really. Uh, I was not one of those people that just like, oh, put it up for 99 cents and it sold a bazillion. I didn't have great cover art. I didn't know, you know, how to like write a blurb that was kind of what people wanted. You know, I, it never <laughs> occurred to me to look at the other books that were selling in my genre. I was also kind of mixed genre. Right. You know, and like, see which ones are doing well. And maybe I should kind of make mine look like theirs and write sort of a similar blurb that would appeal to the same audience. I learned all that along the way. <laughs> and then you also started to write and expand into different genres, mostly speculative fiction genres but now i've seen you know re more more recently he says with air quotes expanding into more urban fantasy and things like that which i've seen i haven't yet read the newsletter that you just sent out today but i saw that it came in and i was like hey i'm gonna be speaking to Lindsay later today but um i'm just curious about that transition and 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 did you jump genres or did you focus on like you know the emperor's edge series did you, did you continue to do that for the fans or how how did that uh, how did that evolve over time? I did write the Emperor's Edge series, the complete series was kind of my focus for the first couple years. And I also wrote a steampunk Wild West thing. That's what the story or the newsletter was announcing the story bundle that um, that I have a collection of novellas in. So that I was kind of experimenting and jumping around early on. That was a historic earth kind of setting yeah and then i had my dragon blood series actually no there was an urban fantasy series i only wrote two books in and the cover art was pretty good and they sold pretty good but my fans were like ew this is first person and set on <laughs> earth this is so lame <laughs> so there were the reviews kind of made me i still read my reviews back then which i do not do now for my sanity made me kind of wilt up and i just abandoned that series and never went back to urban fantasy for you know five years right um but so dragon blood was my second real big series that was high fantasy and yeah. that one was the first thing that kind of it took off to some extent when i boxed up the first three books and made them 99 cents 
that one. I, I think I had got a book bub, one of my first, this was probably like 2014 ish. Yeah. And it, at the time it stuck in like the top 200 on Amazon for like six months. And of okay. course I only had book, I think I had book four come out during that time, but it didn't have a whole series to sell. Um, but that was my first, you know, four or five years into it. My first real, you know, I was making money. I had quit my day job in 2012 or so. Right. But the the Dragon Blood series that that fortuitous 99 cent <laughs> box set, you know, which was a great deal for readers, uh, came out and that kind of took me to another level. And then you know I got antsy. I tried a pen name, did some sci fi romance. I started writing some space opera under my name. A thing I've learned is that as long as you commit to doing a whole series, or that was true for me anyway, then you could kind of make it work. Like you can put a lot of effort into promoting the first one if you've got five, six, seven more coming after that. And I found that some fans would cross, you know, they, they, they read everything. I'm amazed today that I have readers that have read everything by me. I'm like, wow, I have stuff I barely remember writing at this point. And they're like, oh, when are you going to come back to this world? So that is uh, you know, that's great. I don't know how well that would work if I leaped completely out of science fiction and fantasy. I did write one contemporary. It was supposed to be a contemporary romance. And then there was like a dead chicken head, headless on the heroine's porch by the end of chapter one. I was like, well, I don't think this is romance anymore. It's <laughs> It was more of a mystery kind of thing. I was, I still write more what I want than, you know, right. really to the genre tropes and stuff a lot of the time. But you seem to listen to your fans, right? Getting engagement from the newsletter and and kind of, it, are there things that are kicked off from feedback where someone says, "Oh, I really like this character. Can I get more of this?" Do you, do you respond to things like that? Honestly, I respond more to sales. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm totally love that they love a series, but it's really hard for my muse to just. I always want to write something new instead of returning to older series. But sometimes, if it was something that sold well and it makes sense financially, I'm like, okay. And okay. I have some that I didn't finish that I'm, I'm trying to go back, and, you know, now and then and finish them. But the last time I did that is like, oh, that's the lowest earnings I've had for like three years in those couple of months <laughs> that I was working. Usually, there's a reason I abandoned the series. But right. fortunately, I've only got a couple left like that. I'm trying to, you know, the last few years, I've been very committed to finishing things. I want the readers to know that they're going to yeah. get a complete series. <laughs> but I, I listen to them, but I'm definitely not somebody that um, writes to, you know, I see authors put up polls like, do you want me to do this, this or this next? And I'm like, oh, I wouldn't want to do any of those things. Because <laughs> <laughs> they don't make as much money. Okay. <laughs> or, you know, like I said, the newer yeah. thing is always easier than, especially when you have like two or three series, complete series in a world, you have to go back and reread everything and yes. really get your head in that space again and try to kind of get into the voices of the characters. So it, it's almost like I have to do research <laughs> in order to go back to this old series versus I can just make up something new by starting a new series. So let, let's talk about your writing process then in terms of like what a typical day is like in ter like w when the writing happens, when the research, when the marketing, when, when Lindsay actually takes a break for herself and the, and the puppies. So I try to, I tend to work on one thing at a time sort of like I try to write a first draft from start to finish obviously you have to answer some emails and, and maybe you do right. some marketing stuff in there these days marketing is usually like emailing the newsletter and and sometimes I write things specifically like I, I just finished a collection of three short stories one I wrote for the Christmas for the blog for Christmas just you know here this is free and there's two new ones and I'm going to use that like oh you know at the end of the book sign up for my newsletter and you can get these um, so I try to do that with almost every series so that's right. I liked writing things for marketing rather than here's here I am. I'm amazing on social media. So you should buy my books, which nothing wrong with that for people who are those kind of extroverted, real big personalities works great for them. <laughs> I, I think I would flop miserably trying to be, you know, TikTok <laughs> on TikTok as myself <laughs> recording videos. And it takes so much more time than people think. But processes I try to write the book from start to finish then I do an editing pass then I send it to my beta readers who I've now have been with me for like 10 years so wow. and one's an editor so I get pretty good feedback from them. the other two have sort of real world knowledge that's definitely been useful one's in the medical field one's a database programmer uh, so and then when they send it back I go over it again you know change whatever 
they suggested that I agreed with or fix plot problems, then send it off to my editor. And then when that comes back, I now have typo hunters. I didn't in the beginning. It's, it's amazing <laughs> how much stuff gets by even the beta readers and editors. And after they do it, they have it, I get to publish it. And um, usually I start working on the next thing while the beta readers have the last right. thing. So I kind of keep things going factory style, which is does not sound glamorous, but that's kind of how it is. Once you get your, you have people booked often, you know, maybe every six weeks or whatever, yeah. you kind of have to keep things going unless you plan in advance and like, okay, we're going to take off August or we won't have anything for <laughs> you. Um, and I am slowing down a little bit now. I, I still, the urban fantasies are only about 80,000 words versus I, I did some epic fantasy last year, like there were 150, 200,000 words. Wow. So I'm still putting out quite a few books to the outside. I may not look like it's slowed down that much, but I'm, I'm writing a little less now and uh, right. you know, trying to not do so much. So I always like asking this question because once you get to a certain point, you lose track, but how many, how many novels or books do you have out? I haven't counted for a while. And Joanna Penn asked this too, and uh, probably over a hundred by now. Okay. So, and uh -huh. then I, I actually, I'm thinking of rebranding the pen name and just putting my name on them so people can find them. Cause I haven't yeah, written like... anything new, <laughs> you know, it's been like three years and these, here's these 15 novels I wrote under the pen yeah. name that, you know, sell five copies a month or something. Cause I haven't done anything with that for so long. It's the Richard Bachman books, you know, Stephen King yeah. writing as Richard Bachman. Mm -hmm. right? So whatever so Lindsay Broker like, writing as. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So eventually I'm going to have the covers redone and both names on the covers so people can find them and, you know, cause they're, they're still my style. They're very much in my voice. They're just right. a little steamier than I usually write under my name. Yeah. So people active who, romance, I think that was your that's term. Right. For it. More active <laughs> romance. There you go. But yeah, but then for people who enjoy more active romance, they get more Lindsay. Right. So that's, that's kind of a cool thing. So at what point, at what point I know you, you actually, you ended up leaving the full-time uh, work uh, pretty early on in the process, like in the pioneering days of self-publishing. But at what point did you realize, okay, this isn't a flash in the pan. This is a thing, right? Because you, you mentioned some, some folks who were big names back in the day. And I, I'm not sure. I haven't done in-depth research, but you seem to have stuck it out. <laughs> One of the voices that's been consistent from you know the the earliest days of this of this venture what at what point did you realize that this was actually going to be a career I always wanted it to be but I I all along the way I've been very much thinking this may not last or at least being able to earn this much to this extent you know and there's more pressure now you're spending more for ads and things so right. you always kind of feel like oh someday it's it's not going to be as great so don't i i never really want to rely too much on the income staying at the level it's at like i i don't believe that i'm going to be on the street in a cardboard box <laughs> probably like i feel like i've got a decent fan base built right. up at this point that i could continue to make a living at this even yeah. if you know, things change and uh, suddenly it's much harder or I have to sell direct because Amazon is kicking everybody off, which is happening right now. I keep yeah. seeing stories and every time I see that, especially if it's somebody I've heard of and or kind of know, I'm like, really? I don't think they were doing anything shady. So you're, always, I'm always a little yeah. bit nervous about that. Not, maybe not nervous, but aware of the possibility. But you make stuff available to fans early, right? Is that one of the strategies that you've employed? I do have a Patreon where I do that. I started that when I started going exclusive with Amazon because I was not until 2016 yeah. and I'm still, I take things out eventually and go wide with the other yeah. books, but uh, I started that so they could get the books on Patreon for whatever e-reader yeah. before I clicked the exclusivity and published on Amazon. So that's the main reason I have the Patreon, but I, I have this last year tried to do a few more things on there, a couple of little bonus things, just with the thought that, uh, you know, if I ever need to rely on that more fully because right now it's a fairly small portion of my income. I, I always enjoy wherever right. money wants to come in from. I don't, you know, <laughs> scoff at it or anything <laughs> like that, but I have, I only remember to mention it to the newsletter like once a year. Oh, wow. Really? Okay. Cause I'm, and I would, I would think that potentially you saying a small percentage of income is probably more money than most authors would make in a year anyways. Wow. <laughs> and I'm not saying is. that, you know, I'm just saying that, you know, comparatively, 
that right. that income is probably a, a a decent amount of money, but considering your greater <laughs> the universe of all of the right, it's a smallish that. percentage. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah but yeah. uh, yeah, it's something I could ramp up. I figure if I needed to, and I could add kickstarters and. Yeah. Having done the one Kickstarter in 2012, though, I know how much work it is to sign all these books and <laughs> ship them everywhere. And yeah, so I do keep that in mind. But uh... so you're you're an introvert, and um, and and you make that very obvious. Now you know you mention it all the time in the six figure author podcast and stuff like that. And yet you have you know people like me wanting to constantly pump you for information. People wanting to interview you, want to talk to you. You got fans and readers coming and just like, I want more, tell me more. I love your stuff. I need more Lindsay Broker. So how does an introvert deal with a, a being a celebrity to other writers, but then also being a celebrity to, uh, you know, fiction readers as well, who just can't get enough of you. Uh, like that, that's gotta, that's gotta be a challenge. And how do you deal with that? You know, I have days where I'm better for whatever reason, some days are easier to like answer emails and yeah. reply to all the comments on the Facebook page. So I just try to do it on those days. And then other days I just want to hunker down and write and like be left alone. But I definitely have periods of days where I'm like, why am I even, I could just be a hermit in the woods and turn off all the social media and just publish the books. <laughs> would it even matter? I don't know. And I don't know uh, how much that would affect things, but we'll see if I ever disappear someday, you'll know the um, urge to, go be hermit a hermit in the woods it's too, was too strong to ignore <laughs> oh man and i was so thrilled i was so thrilled because when i reached out i thought this would be great you, know, you were kind enough to provide content for my 300th episode which hasn't come out by the time we're doing this interview but will have come out by the time you dear listener are listening to this the space-time continuum but um i was sad when 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 you and joe and andrea retired the seven uh, seven figure six figure author podcast <laughs> i'm just extrapolating the six figure author podcast then then you were on joanna pens the creative pen so it was awesome to get caught up with you and then you guys did a reunion special just 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 within the last few weeks so the the, the question always remains is uh what's next for Lindsay? because Lindsay has done so many different podcasts several with joe as one of your co-conspirators as well what's next are you planning on going to any in-person events uh are you going to be thinking about doing is it just going to be more potential special reunion episodes of six figure author well we've talked about maybe doing one a quarter or something like that so okay. there may be as long as people are interested interested in listening i i know in my case i don't follow all the podcasts and what's going on as much anymore i've really yeah. sort of just like i said i do my newsletter i publish my books i throw on my amazon ads and every now and then i'll tinker with something new or i'll try facebook ads again which do not love me and vice versa <laughs> <laughs> but i'm not i don't feel like i really have my the pulse what is this saying my i'm not on the pulse of the world right now i like watch all the tiktok stuff and like oh it's nice for them <laughs> but i couldn't give advice on that yeah so i'm not really up to date on sort of the tactics that are popular all the time so i don't that's one of the reasons i didn't want to do a podcast anymore we we had to get other guests on to talk about that stuff and so much of it comes and goes that's one thing i've seen in my 12 years, which I know to career authors, it started in the 80s. That's not very long, but that's almost the full time of self-publishing yeah. in the Kindle era. I've seen a lot of tactics come and go. And if something speaks to you, go for it, you know, because if you get in early, that could be the thing that gets you in the door, gets you a lot of readers and can kind of set you on the right foot as far as having a career. But at the same time, if it doesn't speak to you next year, there'll be something new. <laughs> It, it sounds though that you've found the the secret, the magic success uh, sauce is you're writing the kinds of stories that interest you, that you're passionate about and interested in, and you're focusing the majority of your time on just producing those great stories for your readers, and obviously ads because you're on Amazon exclusively. So, hey, I got a tool right here. I'm just going to use this tool. <laughs> no need to go and find other things. That seems to that seems to work well. I've definitely found that the series for me is sort of the foundation thing. 
uh, if there's more time, you've got books coming out that people can find them. There's more, you can put more into advertising one when you've got more that they can purchase at full price. Every now and then I do a standalone random thing and it either does really well, which makes me want to do more of them. That happened last year, <laughs> or it just doesn't do much at all. And I'm like, oh yeah, I should just stick to doing series. Uh, and I, I definitely craft my series to have usually like the slow burn romance. So you kind of get that unresolved sexual tension as the fan, yeah. UST <laughs> as the fans call it. And then you, maybe there's a mystery or a greater problem. I, I like a series like that because I feel it keeps the read through pretty solid. People want right. to keep going, you know, they want the hero and heroine or, or whatever couple you've got to get together. And then they want to see resolution, you know, is the hero ever going to get, you know, find their lost relative or whatever they right. have to accomplish. Uh, so I've found more success with those kinds of series than complete standalones where it's very easy for people to like, Oh, the story is done. Eh, I could check out the next one or not. It's new characters. Eh. <laughs> <laughs> so I romance is tough because of that. And um, that's great for those that make that work. I, I do think that fan base is very likes their new couple in each book so they're kind of trained for that so it's maybe not as hard as in fantasy or another genre where if you right. i know as a reader if i see that book two is like from a different character's point of view <laughs> i'm like what is this yeah. i often don't continue on because i am somebody who falls for characters and, and, it, and it's intriguing that you're talking about writing epic fantasy and steampunk and and science fiction and yet you want to have a mystery you want to have this slow burn potential romance like I, I always think back to tv shows like cheers it was always fascinating with the sam and diane where they're not together but there's the hope that they could get together you saw it on castle you saw it on different shows and and it's the the anticipation that that's a lot more fun than the actual getting together right yes and i was not a cheers fan but i loved frazier for niles and daphne so yeah. same same thing <laughs> yeah same writers although they were so delightful even the last couple of seasons they were together yeah they were just those those were like my my favorite kind of characters that i like to write a little quirky you know and so yeah. you really fall in love with them as a reader or a viewer but yeah that is often an element in whatever genre i do right. i'm all about the characters that hopefully people want to spend time with Awesome. Speaking of spending time with great characters. So for any writer who's listening, who wants to learn by, you know, seeing a master at work, what, what... <laughs> is that me? That's you. That's You're you, so Lindsay. flattering, <laughs> Mark. <laughs> where would somebody who's never read any Lindsay Broker, where would you recommend that they're a, a really good place to start might be? If they're, you know, I have my Death Before Dragon series is urban fantasy set in Seattle. So that's the contemporary stuff. If you like Earth, if you're kind of into having stories set on Earth, that's <laughs> okay. a little more accessible than, you know, a galaxy far, far away. But um, and Death Before Dragons. Now, was that the original one that you came back to or was that a, a, newer, ver a newer urban fantasy? That's the one I launched right uh, in 2020 right as the world was falling apart so <laughs> i didn't think it was going to do well it kind of came back and, and did well okay and then i'm doing the spinoff right now legacy of magic which the fans are really enjoying the characters in that one the heroines she's a half dwarf and uh she she jokes that like she always has a shave and stuff and pluck her eyebrows she's very <laughs> she loves to eat cheese so she's a kind of everyday or every you know every man every woman kind of character yeah. so the readers are enjoying that series but that's a spinoff and this is the first time where I've done a spinoff series where they were both exclusive to Amazon. So I'm getting all the KU readers that are right. checking out the new one and going back to check out the old one. Okay. So that's a good thing to do. <laughs> Which, you know, most people are like, well, duh. But because so much of my stuff is wide, I never had that experience before when I did a spinoff. Right. Uh, yeah. So. It's been a good year, which you feel bad saying when it's like, oh, we're having an economic recession and downturn and people are getting <laughs> laid off. I'm like, actually, they're reading a lot right now, at least. So well, that's good. Reading is affordable entertainment when you think about the the alternatives, too. Uh, are your uh, books avail available in print and audiobook as well? They are. And um, that series is as my when I produce my audiobooks, they're not exclusive. Some of my the ones that go oh, through okay. my audio publisher are yeah. they yeah. they sign on and do like itunes and audible so yeah. it's but i i'm enjoying having the audiobooks out everywhere and eventually the ebooks will follow i would probably wait once i know i'm not going to do new installments start right. moving things out because I, I i do not like as many authors being 
totally beholden to the the largest river as you call it <laughs> and you know you do feel when the when you're signed up for the exclusivity that it's yeah. tough because you used to kind of slack off on the marketing of the other books too just recently i've been like oh i should probably mention that i have you know this is free a series <laughs> starter over here on the other stores and try to keep things from dying completely yeah. you know you do, you like to get income from many areas when you are an author Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Now you've given so many great tidbits and advice for other writers. Uh, I was just wondering to throw sort of a last one out there, which is either what's advice that you wish more writers knew that you, it doesn't often get shared. You know, there's so many people sharing bits of advice for writers and then what's something that you think more writers sh should, should be aware of um, or, or even if it's a, a classic, a classic bit of advice that you think they don't pay enough attention to. I think a lot of people, and I'm actually a bad example because I've made it work. A lot of people want to genre hop. Uh, they right. they love to read many genres and they want to jump around and they, you know, they write three books in one genre. It doesn't sell. They try something new. And I, I, I'm like, you can do that once. You know, if the first genre bombed and you want to try another one with the next series, go ahead. Because sometimes you started either cross genre and it's hard to promote and you didn't know any better because it's your first series. And if you know more now and want to try again in another genre, that could work out. But I see the going from genre to genre to genre and they never get any momentum or traction because the readers will not follow. Some of them will, if you have a really distinct voice, like I said, I've been lucky to have some readers that will read everything, but I definitely have some readers that only want my sci-fi. And every time I publish new fantasy, they're like, Hey, you coming back to star kingdom anytime soon. I really miss your sci-fi. <laughs> But it's so much easier if you just stick, like when you look in the top charts for your genre, I mean, I don't know how it is for every genre, but when I look at urban fantasy and paranormal romance and those, those authors that are always in there in the top 100, just completely killing it. Every book they release is very in that they're staying in their lane. They picked it. That's their thing. Maybe, you know, and that's how you really gain, like, you know, I, I've been lucky, but I've made it harder on myself than I needed to by following the muse. So I just want authors to be aware that if you're going to follow the muse, you may not have as much success financially and, you know, get as many people reading your books as if you wrote three series eventually or however many you want to write in the same genre. And because sometimes it takes a while to pick up momentum. And then when you do, you want the readers to be able to go out back and buy the backlist. And they're going to be more likely to do that if it's similar to what they just read and liked. Awesome. Awesome. Lindsay, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Could you please share with my listeners where they can find out more about you online? Uh, LindsayBroker.com. Spell it any way you like. Google will probably find it. And I'm still <laughs> on Twitter. <laughs> I'm just trying to ignore. You lose craziness. your blue check mark. <laughs> There's a doge dog on the page right now instead of a Twitter bird as we record this. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, I'm still there. I'm just ignoring it. And Facebook, I'm on there too, uh, on my author page. And that's about it. Of course, in the various stores too. Awesome. Lindsay, always great to catch up with you. Thanks again for hanging out with me today. Great. Thanks for having me, Mark. So before I get into the reflection, I just want to say after this interview with Lindsay, which I think we did in early April of 2023, so yeah, I am very far behind on getting, you know, the podcast into the queue, and every once in a while I'll slip in a episode because it's timely for some reason, and so I feel I feel bad for authors I interviewed early on, and, and I still haven't worked, uh, worked our way up. A couple things, though, um, mentioned that Lindsay had mentioned in the interview that uh, her and Joe and Andrea were going to potentially do updates maybe once a quarter for Six Figure Author Podcast. And this week, the week of June 23rd, which is when this episode's going out, the, they just released, or I just listened to the, the latest update that the three of them shared. Very short episode, but always great to hear from, from Lindsay and Andrea and Joe. But... Also in the conversation, Lindsay had mentioned, um, I had mentioned, I had read her first few books when they were from patio books way back in the early days, you know, 2010, 11 uh, era, probably 2011 was when I was listening to them, uh, 11, 12. And I hadn't read her stuff in a long time. And so when she mentioned for people who want to get into her stuff to check out that Death Before Dragon series, 
So I picked up on Kobo, I got the audiobook Sinister Magic, which is book one in the Death Before Dragon series. And oh my God, it is so good. I was reminded of just how amazing a writer Lindsay is, how much I enjoyed um, those Emperor novels, those early ones I've read of hers. And of course, you know, you get busy and you move on to different things. And I hadn't read her other stuff. Now, I'm not as big into the, well, that was more steampunkish fantasy, but I'm I'm not as into the that kind of epic fantasy and not a huge sci-fi reader. However, this sinister magic was, was my cup of tea. And it reminded me just how much I love Lindsay's writing. I love her characters, the dialogue, the way they interact with one another and her very distinctive voice. And I think a lot of her success as a writer is because the people who read her books not only love the stories that she tells and the genres that she's writing in, but they come back for her. They come back for more of her writing. And I can definitely see that because I'm a big fan and I'm looking forward to reading more books in that uh, Death Before Dragons series. Really entertaining, really enjoyable another excuse to go on a long walk and and i did listen to a lot of death before dragons doing some significantly longer solo walks and so uh, just just great stuff so if you haven't checked checked out her writing definitely worthwhile because then you can kind of see well, why why is Lindsay so successful well obviously she's successful because she's a damn good writer but she's also been very consistent and she's been very deliberate and so she talked a little bit about this is getting into more reflections you know yeah of course she'll listen to her readers and stuff like that but she listens more to the revenue where is the money coming in and obviously you know she does write she does follow the muse a bit in terms of what she wants to write and genre hops and, and, and recommends not doing that. But 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 I actually think writing the things that she likes is part of her success because it gives her the opportunity to have fun and explore. And it comes through in her stories, in, in her characters. And I think that's really important. The other thing, and I use this for the clip, for the beginning, the teaser of the episode, was, was that reminder like she put in all this work so she worked wanted to get this manuscript and very first manuscript um, that first book she published to get it in front of an agent and waited and waited and waited and then finally went and said and was determined and said no I'm I'm not patient and she admits that uh, in this interview as well as on the <laughs> on the six figure author podcast but basically says no I'm not going to do uh, or I've, I've done all this work, I've, I've got the editing done, I've got the cover, I've done all this work and research, I've learned how this works, and then the agent calls at the last minute. But she made that very definitive, that very powerful decision to just follow through on her investment. And I often wonder, we get to those crossroads in our lives where we make these decisions, and obviously that worked out really, really well for Lindsay, because had she not hit publish maybe this would have been another process that would have taken her down a completely different path and and sort of spoiled her taste for the thrill of the storytelling because of all the right understanding your personality type is like I, i'm not a patient person i i, I want to she says i write the book i get the book done it's edited everything you know with the alpha readers and beta readers and then it's edited and it goes out the door as quickly as it can that's the way she prefers to operate. And so the lesson here, or the reflection, is that you're going to recognize the things that you like and don't like. You're going to recognize the things that you're good at, the things that you don't like, that you're not good at. It's okay to play up to those strengths. It's okay to pause and take a look at where you sit and how you plan on operating your own author business and what works well for you. It doesn't always work out. You know, we make mistakes along the way. We're going to make errors along the way. But I honestly believe that following the, not the path of least resistance, because I'm not saying to always take the easy road, because there are a lot of hard things that we have to do along the way. But sometimes following those natural things that seem to work well for us could be something that can help you out, particularly if you're struggling. I've often thought, you know, when I encounter sort of writer's block is, is that really my subconscious telling me that there's something about 
this scene or there's something about what are where I'm trying to force the characters to go or I'm you know trying to get from scene A to scene B and I'm and I'm not able to find that line that maybe there's something else that needs to happen in there. Oftentimes when I do get into blocks like that I go and do something else or I'll write on a different project and sometimes I can come back to that same moment and then see the path then see the new way to go. Um, I, again just some thoughts, just some reflections. But again, when I look at how long Lindsay's been doing this and the consistency and the persistence and the fact that she's willing to learn, she's willing to try things. And when she fails, she's like, no, that didn't work out so well. I'm going to try this other thing now. She's constantly learning. She's constantly growing. And she's never given up on that dream of being a writer, being a storyteller, and of course, entertaining so many readers with her fantastic words. So that's it for this episode. That's it for my reflections. I want to thank you for listening to the podcast. I want to say a huge shout out to all of my patrons who support this podcast over at patreon.com slash Stark Reflections. Thank you guys so much for supporting the podcast. Really means a lot to me. And a reminder, again, based on episode 310, I've got some opportunities for patrons to win some of the bookmark on uh, conference um, tickets for that virtual conference that I'll be speaking at. And I did talk to Dana Claire in the last episode about that. So I did see a number of patrons have put their name in and I will be doing the draw next week. I'll be doing the draw next week and announcing it on next week's episode, but also available for purchasing tickets for bookmark on you can use the coupon code mark 50 m-a-r-k five zero that'll get you fifty dollars off the registration for bookmark on and that'll be in the show notes of course at starkreflections.ca if you do like the podcast you can leave a review for it on wherever you listen to your podcast and i do appreciate that so much or even better yet share this episode or any episode of the podcast that you really enjoy with someone that you think is going to find value in it. And so, as I said, that's it for this episode. Until next week, and until next episode, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com.